Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. It is time to study the word. It's time to do Bible study. I was saying before we started, before we started recording that we have not been together for a few weeks. If you've been following the sessions, this will just be an automatic next session for you. But we've all had a little break and it's lovely to be back together. Lovely to have you all back together and uh, to have everyone that's watching online. If you're watching live or on the recording, it is Awesome to be in the Word of God with you on this beautiful, chilly Wednesday morning. Absolutely. Well, before we get started, you've noticed maybe that this year I've been doing a little bit of Bible trivia just for some fun, because I think it's also fun that we increase our just general knowledge on the Word and on just some fun things. So here's some quick uh, little quiz questions. Let's see how many of you know the answers to this. Um, If you don't, there's absolutely no harm. Don't worry about it. It's just all about fun and just increasing our knowledge in the word. Who can tell me what is the shortest verse in the Bible? Does anybody know what is the shortest verse in the Bible? That's right, mom. That's right. Jesus wept. That is the shortest verse in the Bible found in John chapter 11, verse 35. The shortest verse, Jesus wept, full stop. (laughs) A very interesting story about that. You can go and check out why did Jesus weep at that point. Okay, who can tell me who was the oldest person who lived in the Bible? The the oldest recorded person that lived, the longest lifespan on earth. Anyone know? Who, mom? Mother, how do you know this? Have you been reading my notes? Yeah, my mother, look at her. She's just popping out the answers like this. That's right. How long did he live? Do you know? How many years? Okay, well, this chap lived for 969 years. Like, seriously. So if you are in your 70s and you think you're old, my sweethearts, you're not. You still spring chickens in the eyes of Methuselah. 969. You can... You can read about that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. That's the the man who lived the longest, 969 years old. Okay, another fun fact. Who can tell me there were two men in the Bible that never that weren't that didn't die, they were raptured? Two men that didn't die, they were raptured. Elijah and? And is it Also an E? Elijah and? Anyone online know? Also an E? Uh, 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 anyone know? Elijah. Heather, do you know? Is it Esau? Close, close, not Esau. It's Enoch. In oh, yeah. en- Enoch and Elijah, the two men that didn't actually die, the word of God records that they oh, were raptured. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, and Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. This is just all fun information, all right, just to increase our knowledge. And one last question, we've just recently celebrated the death and resurrection of Jesus over the Easter time. Who knows how long did Jesus hang on the cross for? For how many hours did Jesus actually hang on the cross? Anyone know? Anyone know here? Anyone know online? Okay, Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. That's the time span that he was on the cross, and you can read about that in Mark chapter 15, verse 25 to 37. Just some fun biblical knowledge. And interestingly, everything I've just told you all has meaning, all has significance, and each of these little fun facts can have their own study. But we are not studying that today. It was purely just for fun. Let's get into our anchor scripture. Now we're really getting into the study today. Thank you for bearing with me with some fun Bible trivia that I so enjoy. Our anchor scripture for this year, ladies, is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Let's say it together. But even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. That is our anchor scripture for 2024. Even more blessed, even more makarios in the Greek is the word for blessed, which means content in all circumstance, favored, highly envied by others. Why would you be envied by others if you are blessed? Well, because if you are in a situation, in a circumstance where other people are like, why are you not losing it? Or why are you not responding in the way that is like a natural response? Why is it that you're so content? Why do you have so much peace? It perplexes people. It doesn't make sense to people. You find yourself in a situation where, where you have this peace and this joy and this love, this contentment in your spirit. Content in all circumstances does actually make people wonder what's going on with you. 
right? Why? Why is that? Because you are blessed. Blessed are those who hear the word of God, which you are doing right now, and who put it into practice. Those who do the word, those who observe the word, those who guard the word, those who value the word of God above everything that they are seeing in their life with their natural eyes. Those people are the blessed ones. How do we do this? How do we put the word of God into practice? And what we are studying in this particular study is with the help of the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness me, we cannot do it without him. We cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in order to be able to put the word into practice. We need his help. And that's why we are studying the Holy Spirit. Let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you that we can come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, you are here right now. I thank you, Lord, that you will just settle every one of our hearts, every one of our minds, every distraction that we might be um, consumed with at the moment. And I ask you, Lord, to help us zone into your word. Reveal truth to us. Open up our understanding to everything that you want to teach us and show us today through your word, by your power, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we need the Holy Spirit. We all can agree with that, right? Who is the Holy Spirit? Let's do some quick recaps. It's been a while since we've been together. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We believe in the triune fashion or the trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's not half God. He's not a portion of God. He is God. That is who the Holy Spirit is. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, very simply because Jesus saw we needed help. When he was on earth, he's like, you guys need help. When I'm going to go now to my father, I can't leave you alone. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who is going to be able to help you in your life. How do we get the Holy Spirit? At the moment of salvation, ladies. At the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in his glory, in his majesty, in his power. He infiltrates and woof, he comes and makes his home right within you. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is here. He's residing in every single one of us. This is where he is living. John chapter 15 we did that in a couple of sessions ago, talking about Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, and we need to produce fruit. And we learned how do we produce that fruit is through the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit, he's our parakletos, he's our helper, he's our guide, he's our advocate, he's our counselor, he's our coach, he's our mentor. I'm adding all of these wonderful descriptions as we're paraphrasing from, from the description of parakletos. The Holy Spirit is literally your, your standby, your person who's with you all the time, 24-7, who is there to assist you in life. He's your greatest personal assistant, greatest coach, greatest advocate, greatest counselor, greatest comforter and strengthener that you can possibly imagine. He is with you constantly. And one of his missions, besides helping you with everything in life, is to transform you to start looking more like Jesus. We did that a few sessions ago as one, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. One degree to the next we are starting to look more and more like Jesus. And one of the ways that we can clearly see that is through the fruit that is evidence in our life. Remember in John 15, I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. Those who are, that abide in me and I abide in them, they will produce fruit. As a matter of fact, let's read it. Let's just read it directly from the word. John chapter 15 and verse 4. Jesus speaking, dwell in me. So how do we dwell in Jesus? Remember, I've said this very practically. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. How do we dwell in him? If he's sitting there but in heaven with Jesus, with, with Father God. We only can dwell in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We've studied this already in previous sessions. Please go back and go and listen to them because today is session six already. So if you've missed some others, go back and listen. Dwell in me, he says, and I will dwell in you. 
The Amplified Version says, Live in me and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in, vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Jesus is talking here about fruit. He's saying you cannot produce fruit if you are not connected to me. You cannot be connected to me unless you have the Holy Spirit. So there, here we see the key of all of this is the Holy Spirit in order for us to bear fruit. And as we bear fruit of the Spirit, we start looking more like Jesus. Okay, so what is fruit? Fruit is the Greek word karpos, K-A-R-P-O-S, which literally means from a tree or offspring. So the offspring of a tree will bear the characteristics of, of the tree. As a matter of fact, you can even use the word karpos when you refer to your children. You can say, my children are my karpos, they're my offspring. So your children, your, if you, you, you have children, you, those children start behaving like you, start looking like you. Have you noticed that sometimes you might pay attention, your child saying something that you say, or they're mimicking something your husband does, or they're mimicking something that you do? You, you know, and, and, and often us as parents who say, don't do what I do, do what I say. And that's impossible. You can't make that statement to your children because your children learn from your behavior. They learn from your character. They start picking up on things as they abiding, dwelling, living with you. Likewise, when we abide with the Lord and we, st and we start living in the presence of God, you will start picking up on his characteristics. You will start bearing the fruit of the of with the, the character of Jesus because you are dwelling in him and that is all through the Holy Spirit. Now let's have a look quickly at seed because fruit has to come from seed. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. Let's jump that. It's towards the end of the New Testament. 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says this. You have been regenerated Born, thing I just read now, those seeds are in you already. And today we are going to be looking at the very first one, which is the fruit of love. The fruit of love, which is the character of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And it's in you. Now, previously, some time ago, we did a comprehensive study on love. For those of you who remember it, I think all the ladies that are here sitting with me today, you were part of that study. It was comprehensive. It was an 11-part study. Wow. Now I'm going to try to take that 11-part study and kind of shrink it into one session to try to give you an explanation and an understanding of love. But it is such a profound fruit. It is so huge and magnitudinous. I do not even know how we can possibly shrink it into one session. But by the help of the Lord, we will do that. But let's have a look into it. The fruit of love. Love is such a beautiful word. I, I love the word love. Do you love the word love? And there's so many incredible songs that have been written about love. Oh, my word, love. Love changes everything. All I need is love. You know, you can just think of all these incredible songs. But I do feel, and I said this in the study that we did in love, that the English language really does not get the word love right. Think about it. You can say, you can use the word love in so many terms. You can say, oh, I love coffee, which I really do. You all know that. You can say, I love coffee. You can say, I love my dog. Say, oh, I love pizza. Oh, I really love pizza. And then you can say things like, I love you, Lord. Now, how can you compare loving the Lord to loving pizza? You can't. It's two different types of words, right? And that's where the Greek language just expresses it so magnificently. The Greek people really just get it right. They know how to express words correctly. And in, in the Greek language, there are four different words for love. One of the words is eros, which is an erotic love. That's a type of love you'll have between a husband and a wife, an eros love, romantic, sensual love. Another type of love is filial love which is a friendship love. So when you've got friends in your life and you've got people that you're acquainted with and you love your friends, that's a filial love. Then you get a storge love. Now, storge love is a family love, the type of love you have for your family. Because if you think about it, the love, the way that you love your brother, your sister, your nieces, your nephew, is going to be different to the way you love a, a, a friend, right? It's a storge love. And then we get to the love which we are talking about today. And you know what this is. It's the ugape love. 
Agape love, spelled A-G-A-P-E, but pronounced Ugape. Agape love. And this is love we are talking about. This is the love that the fruit is talking about. The fruit of the Holy Spirit of love is agape love. That's the love. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we've studied in depth in that previous study, gives the most incredible description, most incredible characteristics. As if I remember right, there's 15 characteristics of what love looks like, of the way that you can explain love. It is just so beautiful. But in 1 Corinthians 13, it also tells you what love is not. And let's go and check that out. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, just from verse 1 to ver verse um, 3, that I'd like us to read, just to help us rem be, remind, remind ourselves of what love is not. Let's have a look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels so pause there what this is saying is that you are able to speak the way angels do in other words have the interpretation to speak to God understand God have that type of um, communion with him the tongues of men referring to the linguistics of man the multiple languages of men you can go back and listen to the whole study if you want because we did a whole session on this very specific verse verse and says if you have all that ability but you have not love then, my friend, what you are, you are only a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And the noisy gong, that in brief, if I can just remind you, the noisy gong refers to the pagan worship when the, when the pagans would come and they would bang on these drums to get people into a state of trance, a trance-like state, when they would worship and dance unto their pagan gods. That's a very intense description. And the clanging symbol refers to the time of war when the when the when the people when people would go into battle and they'd have people in the front that would be clanging on the um, the symbols telling people it's time for battle, it's time for war. So what the scripture is saying is you can have the ability to speak like angels and have the tongues of men, but if you do not operate in love, you're just making a giant noise. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the scripture says. The next part, and if I have prophetic powers, wow, how many of us want that? So we have the gift of interpreting the divine will of God. Gee, wow. If I've got this prophetic um, power of gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and if I understand all the secret truths and mysteries, goodness me, and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove the mountains, man, that sounds fantastic, but if you do not have love operating in your life, the word of God says, I am nothing. The Amplified Version says, a useless nobody. Gee, that's quite dramatic. That you can have all this power, you can have all this faith, but if you do not have love in your life, you're just a useless nobody. Then it says in verse 3, even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, so you're someone that's so charitable, and if I surrender my body to be burned, oh, painful, so you're a martyr, or in order that I, in order that I may glory, but if I have not love, I gain nothing. So what that scripture there is saying is you can have all this incredible faith and charitable deeds and you can do all these amazing, mysterious things, understand the mysteries of God, be able to interpret the will of God. But if you do not have the fruit of love operating in your life, my friend, it means nothing. It means nothing. So love is a foundation for everything. Love is the foundation for all the other fruit that we are going to be studying. It is quite the most beautiful fruit that we can possibly look at. And can I please remind everybody that this love is already in you. The seed of love is in you. It's already there. Now what I want to do, I want, us to t I want to take you to a portion of scripture, and I hope you all have a good cup of coffee or tea or water or whatever it is you love to drink, because it's quite a portion of scripture. But I, I wanted to just read one or two verses, and then I realized, you know what, this is so big and beautiful. I'm going to read it to you, the whole portion. 1, 1 John chapter 4, 
from verse 7 to 21. That's a lot of scripture. So you can sit back, listen, you can follow with me in the word if you would like to. I'm reading from the Amplified, but I am going to um, just shrink down some of the, the, extension, the extensions of the words just to make it a little bit quicker so we don't spend our whole time reading this portion. But we're talking about love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Listen to this. Beloved, let us love one another. Remember, we're talking agape love. For love is from God, and he who loves is begotten, born of God, and is coming to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better, clearer knowledge of him. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God and does not know him, for God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest, displayed, where we are concerned in that God sent his son, the only begotten or unique son, into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us so much, we also should love one another. No man has at any time yet seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is brought to completion and into full maturity and runs its full course in us. So what's saying, if you love others, then you, you are experiencing the way God actually is. Verse 13, by this we come to know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given to us the Holy Spirit. And besides, we ourselves have seen and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son, the Savior of the world. Anyone who confesses that Jesus is the Son, God abides in him and he in God. And we know, recognize and understand and believe the love God cherishes for us. God is love and he who dwells and continues to love dwells and continues in God and God dwells and continues in him so it's saying that when you're loving other people it's a clear indication that god is in you verse 17 in this union and communion with him love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so we are in this world in other words if you are loving people and you're in this fruit of love is operational in you the day of judgment, you can just sit back and relax. You can just smile because you know that you did all that God has asked you to do. Love is key. There is no fear in love, but full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. Wow. That sounds like something quite powerful, right? That love in you gets rid of fear? Sure. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment, and so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love. Hmm. Some of you need to hear some keys here. Shall I read that part for you again? For fear brings with it the thought of punishment, and so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love. Verse 19, we love him. Because he loved us first. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother in Christ, he's a liar. Mm, ouch. <laughs> you cannot say you love God and then you hate someone. The word, the word, not Tracy, the word says you are a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, whom he has seen cannot possibly love God whom he has not seen. And this command, this charge, we have from him, please note it's a command, that he who loves God shall love his brother also. That was quite a chunk of scripture, but my goodness, what a beautiful explanation of the importance of love in our lives. Absolutely beautiful. Now, this is, you read the scripture, you're like, is this really possible? Is it really possible to love like this? Well, John chapter 6, verse 63 says, it is the spirit that gives life, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit in us enables us to love like this. It is possible. God's love in you actually operates 24 hours a day. It totally does. It's your choice, though. 
if you're going to walk in that. Remember the very first session, I think we, we studied in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, where it said, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, make it your habit to live in the space where you are surrendering and submitting your own will to the will of the Holy Spirit. And as you live like this, the love of God operates in you. It is possible. Now I want us just to briefly examine this love. It's just, it's too big to examine in a short period of time. But I want us just to look at some, some brief descriptions of God's love for us, which is in us. I'm just going to give you the scripture references. We're not going to turn to it because there's too many. The first thing we can look at is that the love of God is immeasurable. Immeasurable. Now when you think of this word immeasurable, if you cannot measure something, if you picture a measuring tape or a, a, a long rope or a piece of string that you're trying to measure something from a starting point to an ending point, that is something that you can measure. If you can measure something from a start to an end, that is measurable. However, God's love is immeasurable. You cannot measure it. There is no start, there is no end. It is just surpasses our knowledge, as Ephesians 3, 19 says. Surpasses your understanding. God's love is so huge, so big, so immeasurable. Psalms 36 verse 5 says it reaches to the heavens. You cannot measure the love of God. It's too big, it's too big, it's too broad, it's too wide, it's too deep, it's too high. That's how big God's love is for us. It's immeasurable. God's love is also eternal, which means it endures forever. It never stops. Scripture references there is Jeremiah 31 verse 3 and Psalm 107 verse 1. If you miss any of the scriptures, you can go back to the recording. His love is eternal. God's love is unconditional. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 says that he loved us before we loved him. What type of, what type of love is this? You know, often we have in, in our lives, like, I will love that person if they love me. That's a condition. I will do that for him if he does it for me. That's a condition. I will call her if she starts calling me. That's a condition. But the love of God is unconditional. There is no condition attached to it. It's simply, I love you. Because I love you. You don't have to ever love me back. And I will still love you. That's unconditional. Oof. Oh. Amazing, right? Another characteristic of this love is it's sacrificial. John chapter 3 verse 16 is the most beautiful sacrificial scripture that we can read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, most precious, beautiful son, Jesus. Sacrifice is involved with love. Such sacrifice. In Luke chapter 22, 42, when Jesus was in the garden and he was sweating blood because he didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't. But then he said to the, said to the father, not my will, father, but your will be done. That was sacrificial love. Right there and there. The love of God is sufficient it's more than enough under all circumstances. More than enough. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. There is, God's love is so sufficient, it can, never, it can never end. It's like a tap that just keeps pouring and it just never, just keeps on overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Sufficient. And it's constant. Constant. Ongoing. Psalm 136 verse 26. A constant love. Can you just get this, 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 this picture in your mind, this, this visual, this dramatic image, if you would like, of a overflowing dam, an overflowing waterfall that just doesn't end, just a waterfall of love that just keeps coming and just keeps coming. And it doesn't matter what you do to try to stop it. It cannot stop. It just keeps on pouring out. There is no start point. There's no end point. It just keeps on flowing ongoing, ongoing, was beautiful, unconditional, sacrificial, beautiful, agape love. Doesn't it sound wonderful? Goodness me, and that's the way that God loves us. But that's also the way God says we should love others. Mm. <laughs> mm. Right? We want to receive that love, don't we? We have. 
But then God says, as I've loved you, love others. Oh, sure. Really? Did, did I maybe get it wrong? Did I maybe say something wrong? Let's go back and check in 1 John chapter 4. We've read it. Let me go read to you again. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love springs from God and he who loves his fellow man is begotten, born of God and is coming progressively to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better, clearer knowledge of him. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know, for God is love. There it is. This love, this beautiful love I've explained to you, that love is in us. And it's a command from God to love others. In 1 John 5 verse 3, it says, you'll, if you love me, you'll do what I say. You will love others. It's willful obedience. It's a choice on our part to heal ourselves to the Holy Spirit and allow the seed of love to grow into a full-blown, beautiful fruit of love the same love is in us and that's why when we read scriptures like mark or luke chapter 6 verse 35 when it says love your enemies now you can when you read a scripture like that you're like what come now god i'll be i'll be i'll be nice to them i'll, I'll tolerate my enemy I might even send her a meal when her family is sick because I'm a nice person. But you want me to love her with this type of love? The sacrificial, eternal, unconditional, sufficient, constant, immeasurable love. Oh, I mean, really, Lord? God's like, yes, love your enemy. The only way you can love your enemy is when this love is within you and it is growing. That's why when we read a scripture in John chapter 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend, to sacrifice for someone, to give up something, to do something for the better of someone else. There's no greater love. The only way that's possible is when this love is operating inside of you. Love one another, 1 John 3 verse 11. You, we've read these type of scriptures in the past. You have read these scriptures in the past. We're loving each other and, and doing good for one another and being kind to one another. We're going to be looking in, into some of those other fruits coming up. But everything is based on the foundation of love. It can only be done through love. It can only be motivated through love. In Mark chapter 12 verse 30 when it says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The only way that is possible is when God's love is in you. Do you realize how cool that is? That God doesn't expect you to love him with your own love. Let me say that again. God doesn't expect you to love him with your own love. He puts his love in you and then says, love me with that love. Because the love that you love the Lord then with is not with human love. It is with this love that God himself has put into you. So you're basically giving his love that he's given to you, you're giving it back to him. You're loving him back with this type of love. We can only love like this when the Holy Spirit produces this love in us oh we need the holy spirit we can only love like this when the holy spirit produces love in us remember we need the holy spirit for all of this the seed is within you as we heal to the holy spirit the fruit of love grows the fruit of love grows within you how? Through the washing of the word. As we read the word in Ephesians 5, 26, it talks about the washing of the word that is over us. And of course, in his presence. In his presence. Back to Galatians 5, 22. We did this a few weeks ago, a few sessions ago. And I'm going to just read it again for you. Galatians chapter 5, when we're talking about the fruit of the spirit. Verse 22. I just want to read it. Sometimes it's important for us to read what it says. So you can be reminded word for word. Galatians 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, this is now the Amplified, the work which his presence within accomplishes. So the presence of God within us 
accomplishes this. So how does this happen? It's through the word and through the work of the Holy Spirit that accomplishes, produces this fruit. The more time we spend in his presence and in his word, we are feeding the seed. The seed is in you, 1 Peter, remember? The seed is already in you. So the more time you're in the word and in his presence, you are feeding the seed, and which is then ready to grow into fruit. It's a direct result. It automatically happens. It accomplishes itself as you spend time in the presence of God. It happens. So you, you, you hear all this, these, this beautiful description of love. Like, oh my goodness, I don't know. How can I do this? You can. In his presence, through the word, it grows automatically. This agape, immeasurable, unconditional, sacrificial love, the fruit of love is in us. I'd like to give you a personal example of where this love, um, where I saw this love evidence in my life in a very difficult situation. So many years ago, my husband and I were in a situation where we were very um, hurt by someone that we really respected someone that we really honored, someone that we loved, someone that we worked with. Uh, we really respected this person. We really served this person for a very long time. And they, they hurt us in, in, in indescribable ways, in, like literally indescribable. To this day, sometimes I think to myself, it's amazing how good God was during that time because it would have been very easy for us to walk away from the faith, the, the, the faith of, of believing in the Lord because this person really... They really hurt us. But what I must say is at that time, we made a conscious decision because we were already mature in the Lord that we would not allow offense to grip our hearts. This is such an important key. <laughs> you know, in a time when someone hurts you really badly, it's very hard to maybe love that person straight away. But what you can do is endeavor not to allow the offense to grip in your heart. It mustn't settle there. It mustn't become rooted within you. Because when that offense is rooted in you, it is very, very hard to overcome it. So we thank the Lord and I thank the Holy Spirit for guiding us at that point. We honestly and truly endeavored not to allow offense to grip us. But we did have to walk away. At that time, we're like, we just we can't be in the situation any further. We had to walk away from the situation, and there were many other reasons for it as well. But we went for a period of about three years where we never spoke to this person. And during those three years, it was very hard if we ever saw them, if we ever heard their voice. It was it was just a very difficult situation. We just couldn't. We it, it, it's, and it and I can confidently say it wasn't because we were offended. It was just because we were recovering from the hurt. There was hurt, it was deep, and the Lord was restoring in our hearts. He was doing a deep work inside of us, but it took us time. Could it have happened quicker? Probably if we had just healed it a bit quicker, okay? But it, it, it took us about three, three and a half years. Um, but during this, this period of time, when we were really uh, pursuing the Lord and just asking the Lord just to help us get over what had happened, um, the Lord worked very gently with us, and at one point he said, okay, it's time that you need to restore. It's, it's, you have forgiven, you've spoken out forgiveness, you've, you know, we've done all the right things that we need to do, but we need to restore. And I'm like, oh Lord, please God, that's so hard. And so we prayed and we said to the Lord, okay, okay, you know, sometimes we can be so clever and we can say, okay, Lord, yeah, okay, we'll do it. But, <laughs> and I said, okay, Lord, we'll do this, but then you need to create the opportunity. I'm not going to go out for the opportunity. Can you create the opportunity so that we can see this person? Please, Lord, don't put me in a position that I have to go to them. Can you please just create the opportunity? So the words weren't even cold out of my lips. <laughs> we got a phone call inviting us to an event where this person would be. And uh, normally we would have said no, but we immediately accepted it because we could see the hand of God, how he was orchestrating things for us to be at this event. But leading up to this point, we prayed. I'm like, oh, Lord, I do, I, we just did not know what to expect. 
um, we had forgiven them in our heart. We had we had spoken out words of forgiveness, and um, you know we had we had repented of anything that we had maybe done wrong before the Lord. But we had not seen this person for three years, and we did not know what to expect. It it was one of those situations where we were just like. It, was he going to ignore us? Was it, you know, it, we just had no idea. But we were obedient to what the Lord said. We listened to what he said, and we did. We went to the event. And while we were standing there and waiting for this person to walk in, I felt like I had a, 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 a farm of butterflies flying a million miles an hour. Not butterflies, bees. I'll go with bees. Like a, like a, a what, not a farm of bees, what do you call them? A, a swarm of bees that was flying around on the inside of me. It was literally like, because I, I, I did feel nervous. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was going to feel. I didn't know how we were going to respond. And as this person walked in, I remember just saying, oh Lord, we need your help right now. And when I saw this person, the only thing I, the only way I can describe it to you is I felt that waterfall of love pouring into my heart. It's, it's the only way I can explain it. I, I didn't remember up until this point, it's like we had forgiven, but I still didn't want to see them. I didn't want to hear his voice. I didn't want to look at his face. But as I turned and I saw them walking into the room, this waterfall of love just poured over me. It was just like, I looked at this person, I'm like, oh my word, I love this person so much. I love, I respect, I honor, I thank you, Lord, for this person. There was this crazy, weird, supernatural type of non-make sense love. Bearing in mind that up until this point, this person had done nothing to show repentance, had done nothing to apologize. On the contrary, we had heard things about what this person had said about us over the years, which, had, which could have caused even deeper hurt. So there was no natural reason for me to feel love. There was no natural reason. But when I saw them, I just experienced this love that washed over me in such a big way. So when, by the time we were face to face, we could genuinely embrace and we could genuinely hug and say, it's so good to see you. It is so good to see you. That, my friends, is fruit in action. What was my responsibility and my husband's responsibility? It was our responsibility to listen to what the Lord was saying, to obey what the Lord was saying, and to be in the presence of God. That was our responsibility. And then it was the Holy Spirit's responsibility to pull the love, to grow the love on the inside of us. I cannot in my human capacity have loved that way. It is not possible. It is not possible for me to have loved them with that type of love in my own human capacity. It was the Holy Spirit's responsibility to take that seed of love because it had been washed with the word of God, because I had been in the presence of God, it was his responsibility now to grow that love so that when I was face to face with this person, it could be genuine love that I was showing to this person. It was the Holy Spirit in that moment that burst that fruit of love open into my heart and it was a supernatural experience. Now, that is maybe a very, uh, very elaborate, expressive way to explain to you a, a moment of time in my life. But when we look at the daily interactions in our life, when love needs to operate, it's the same principle. You've got the seed of love already within you. It's already in all of us. We have learned that. It's in us. You've got the Holy Spirit within you already. Your responsibility, your my responsibility is to stay in the presence of God because the presence of God accomplishes this. The being in the presence of God and in the word of God grows this. It's an automatic thing that happens when you are endeavoring to heal yourself to the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit, to obey what he is telling you and to submit to what he is asking you to do. This supernatural love comes from the divine connection with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. 
The fruit of love is powerful. It does not make any normal sense. It does not make sense, but yet it is in us. And it's available to us to love others, to love the Lord, to love our enemies, and even to love ourselves. This type of love is in us to accomplish so much. Supernatural, unconditional, sacrificial, constant, enduring, immeasurable love. It's in us. As I always end these sessions with the, with the Holy Spirit, practical ways on how do we grow in this. Acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Remember to acknowledge him. Welcome him. When you wake up in the morning, good morning, Holy Spirit. When you go to sleep at night, good night, Holy Spirit. I thank you, you are with me here. Minister to me while I sleep. Talk to him throughout the day. Talk to the Holy Spirit. You say, is that not weird? No, it's not weird. He's God. Talk to him. Talk to the Holy Spirit. Then listen to what he is saying to you. He might say something to you through the word directly. He might impress something within you in your spirit. He might say something to you through a friend or through even something you're watching on TV. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It might be through a song. It might be through a radio presenter. Do you know that the Holy Spirit can speak to you through anything he wants, actually? It can be through the wind. It can be through the rain. It can be, you can be in a moment where you're in a situation. And in that moment, something happens. And the Holy Spirit says, this is for you. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Pay attention to what I'm trying to tell you. And then when he tells you something, just obey. Just do it. Do what he says. And then you will see how this fruit just starts growing. Being in the presence of God, being in the presence of the Holy Spirit accomplishes this. It grows it. It produces it. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Dwell in me and you will bear the fruit of love. That's what the word says. You will bear fruit when you dwell in him. When you live, abide in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. This type of fruit, this love, the fruit of love. Don't we all want to operate in that? Hmm? Can you imagine how much easier your life would be? If the fruit of love just automatically was there constantly in your interactions when you're having a little tiff with the hubby, in the interactions with your children when they're giving you the hairy eyeball and um, back chatting a little bit or not hearing you, in the interactions with that person in the shop that is maybe a little bit rude, interactions with your boss or your employees, interactions with people in church, that person who went and sat in your chair, when you're driving in the car and you see somebody throwing you a birdie because you didn't see them coming in front of you, how are you going to respond? Everything is based and founded in your reaction of love. The fruit of love in your life will help you live such a smoother, easier, more fulfilling life when the fruit of love is operating. And the wonderful news is it's in you already. You don't have to go searching for it. It's already there. The seed of love is in you. How's about we all do this together? Why don't we just practically put our hands on our chest or on your tummy or on your head, wherever you want, and say, the fruits of love is in me. It's already here. And now you can say, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you grow this fruit. I healed my life to you. I submit myself to you and I thank you that love now grows in Jesus name amen that's the fruit of love isn't it beautiful right it's not challenging it's beautiful because God's love God's love God's love God's love is in me. God's love is in you. It's beautiful.
fruit of love is producing in you right now while I've been talking to you for this last hour the fruit of love is growing because it's the washing of the word that's what the washing of the word is that's why you're feeling a little bit warm and fuzzy because it's the love of God <laughs> the love is growing on the inside of you that's why when you're in the presence of the Lord and you're listening to a worship song and you're worshiping Jesus you feel that warmth on the inside of you it's the fruit of love that is growing on the inside of you it's growing it's growing it's growing your responsibility stay in the word stay in his presence his responsibility is to grow the fruit amen and amen okay let me just get this one person in ladies that is it for bible study today um i really hope this has been a blessing to you and i hope that you've loved it the fruit of love and i uh, really want to encourage all of you if by any chance you've missed any of the previous sessions the previous five sessions today was session number six please go back and listen to it because it is really just such great foundation of who this holy spirit is and how he plays a very vital key in our life to start producing fruit in our life for us to look like jesus in the next session we move on to the second fruit of the holy spirit which is the fruit of joy so i'll see you there next session see you then god bless have a great week let love grow inside of you cheerio <laughs>